in an interview of yours I read uh, about a situation that I was actually curious about. I mean, you have such a long history of playing with Wayne, uh, and then you you're back in the drum chair for for a couple of gigs here and there, uh, mm -hmm. subbing for Brian. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was wondering, how mm. does it feel? And then I read, yeah, there was a situation for you, and then Wayne told you, uh, don't try to be someone else. Mm. Because you were thinking about Brian, you, you've mentioned in that interview. Well, that's, I mean, that's kind of natural. I remember actually when I started playing with Herbie, the same thing. All of those years I heard Herbie, I heard Tony Williams oh, right, you know, yeah. playing in my brain. You know, with Herbie. So when I started playing with Herbie, some of that seeped out, even though I never really tried to ever play like Tony. Some of that seeped out, some of the approach, just because that's what I heard all those years mm -hmm. with Herbie. So, of course, it's just, you know, kind of naturally there. Um, so, yeah, in a similar way, uh, if I heard the, you know, the Wayne Shorter Quartet, And I heard the textures and the things that Brian did to help really make the sound of that group. It's going to be stuck in my head when we are playing some of the same, you know, the same music. Not some of the same music. So I, I'm, I can't play uh, "Overshadow Away" or some of the songs that I already knew. Yeah. Uh, Joyrider, we played too. You know, yeah. I couldn't play those the way I played them. Back in the day, they, it didn't make sense anymore to play those grooves and the things that happened on that album, yeah. you know, with this band. And the band had developed such a sound, so now I'm fitting in, you know, to that sound. So then how do you fit in to a sound? Basically on songs that I created the grooves for, and then they've been now, uh, they've, you know, morphed into something else totally. And, you know, so you're faced in the moment with, I can't go back to how I played them and how I know them. And now I hear this other sound and that's really what the band sounds like. So, yeah, of course, something about the way he plays would, would penetrate my psyche, you know, when, when playing with them. So it took, you know, definitely, I think, a moment to even find myself, you know, because, again, I don't feel like I could necessarily created or had an opportunity to to uh, really kind of be my highest creative self with Wayne mm -hmm. um, so what I don't do you mean by that well I mean I was playing mostly the group music that's not my highest creative self mm -hmm. okay I'm not saying you can't be creative mm -hmm. of course you can be and there were high moments of creativity for sure but I was not being, I didn't have the opportunity really in any of those situations other than maybe that one band with Herbie to really push my own, uh, you know, push the envelope on my own um, really, you know, creative expression, mm. uh, you know, because it's, it, it just wasn't, you know, that, that free at the time. You know, because, you know, we're playing music to support records and, you know, the music that was created, you know, a certain way. So when the quartet came around, they really, you know, had the opportunity to, you know, move into that direction. And the timing was right, you know, for Wayne, because, you know, when we played, I mean, Wayne would pace the stage drenched and the energy was so high all the time. And he played like a electric guitar player like a lead <laughs> guitar player you know it was just crazy and i look back at some of those old videos um and in this more acoustic uh setting that was created he got to relax a little more and um as he got older i think that was a perfect um evolution you know uh, for him and uh, of his sound and it gave him a chance to have more and find more textures in, in his own playing without all the heavy electronics right. around him. So, uh, but back to what you're saying. Yeah. So we had, a, a, you know, four shows, I think in a row and, um, 
I don't remember when that was said, but um, yeah, he said something like that. He said um, something like, yeah, when you, as soon as you stop trying to be somebody else, you know, that's when it started happening. Mm. Uh, and, uh, you know, he's like, he's like a Jedi, you know I mean? <laughs> they think he's not paying attention, <laughs> but whoa, but he is. <laughs> You know, he definitely, you know, say things for sure, you know, that lets you know that he was really paying attention. Mm. Yeah, for me, for me, reading that comment was, yeah, that was a big lesson right there, you know. Because there's so much in those little words, you know. Yeah, absolutely. But the thing is, you know, I always use other people as inspiration. So in, in essence, it's not necessarily, you know, stop trying to be somebody else, but it's like when you figure out how to let that inspire you to be your highest self, you know, you figure out how the inspiration actually, because um, you never sound like somebody else, you know, no. even when he was saying, you know, what, whatever he was referring to, I didn't sound like Brian Blade, mm. you know, but sure. I think that, you know, he may have detected uh, an inhibition, you know, due to sounding like him. I mean, due to channeling yeah. you know, that sound. You know, an inhibition because I hadn't quite figured out how to let that sound influence me. Yesterday I was checking out that the, um, Money Jungle record. You know, yeah. and I would just wanted to ask you about uh, Clark Terry, how you incorporated him on uh, Florette African. That was really uh, special, I thought, because whenever I heard him do the uh, the mumbles, it was always on a kind of a happy vibe song, you know. And this was this year was more kind of a mysterious, spacious, uh, reflective. I don't know what what kind of mood it was, but it was definitely something different. And I wonder how, when you thought of using him on that tr track. I, I thought that was really a special choice and how he also, how he went about it, you know? Well, I went to um, his house. He was very sick and I went to his house. Um, I went uh, there and he was literally, you know, on laying in bed. Um, I went to visit him there twice. And um, so I can't remember if this was the time that he had just gotten his, um, you know, his leg amputated. I don't remember even if it, I don't do well with certain kinds of details. Um, but, uh, I definitely was there at some point when his leg was amputated and this might've been a time or maybe it wasn't. So, but what I remember about this session is that I went it's thinking I was going to record and playing trumpet and he hadn't been playing and he didn't have the strength. So he played a few little notes, you know, a few things. And, um, there is a little bit of trumpet on, on there though, right? Yeah. Just a little, mm. yeah. But he really didn't have the strength. And you know, I knew I didn't have, uh, really a take, uh, a full take. So, and he knew it, which is, you know, really, you know, like, commend him, you know, in the state that he was in, because uh, he's also on medication, and, you know, just, and he said, uh, let me, um, let me scat, let me do, let me sing. Oh, so you didn't have that in mind before, or? No. Oh. Yeah, so, yeah, so I, I said, okay, and then I said, oh, okay, well, now we have something. You know, I realized that this was the right move. And then as I was packing up, all the mics were packed up because I had an engineer come and record, you know, in his house. Huh. And it was to my demo. We hadn't recorded the song yet. Ah, oh, wow. Yeah, it was to my demo. But we recorded then to, you know, the, the, the demo. And we just replaced the piano, bass, and drums and added things. So his voice was already there. And... Uh, You know, I don't think he realized even it was a demo because I really programmed it 
you know, pretty thorough. Mm-hmm. But uh, the engineer had packed up and we were gone. And then he said, uh, I got one more thing I want to say. And I was like, oh, my God. Like, you know, <laughs> you know like there's no mics. And I said, okay, hold on. And then I just went into Garage Band and put it, you know, put it in record with no track or anything. And he did that cadenza at the end. Mm. And there was no mic, so it was just in the internal mics of the computer. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, okay, well, I hope I can use it, but I got it. And then we just cleaned it up as best we could and put it on there, so it, it sounds like it was just part of the track. It but does. That, I, I wouldn't have noticed. Yeah. 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 The internal mics aren't as bad as people think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that that was uh, that was amazing. Uh, you know, I really I really loved that choice of him having uh, having him mumble uh, on that song, and also to have him not only in the connection of uh, being a mentor to you, and I think one of your artist uh, uh, band leaders, right? How yes, was it when, when 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 you uh, when you first played with him? Well, my very first professional gig was with him when I was 10 years old, and um, I was a guest. Uh, Diane Reeves and I was a guest with uh, him and uh, his East Coast, West Coast jazz giants, which was uh, Louis Belson, George DeVivier, Jimmy Rawls, Garnet Brown, Eddie Lockjaw Davis, and Al Cohen. And um, we went to Wichita, Kansas and played. Uh, so that was the first time. I remember ever getting paid. <laughs> and then uh, when I was 18, I moved to New York, and he said, whenever you come to New York, you know, you have a gig. And I started traveling uh, to Europe with him. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and also, I mean, using him on that track uh, w with your personal connection, but also his personal connection to, to Duke, you know? Well, exactly. I mean, he says that, you know, he's like, hey, Duke, you know. Yeah. On the record, you know. He, First time I understood, hey, dude. And I thought, wow, cool. Oh, <laughs> you know? yeah. But, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, he was um, channeling, you know. It was his last recording. Wow. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Natalie Cole, her last recording was on my record. Mm. On the Mosaic Project. Yeah. And Nancy Wilson's too. That's also Nancy Wilson's last recording. Wow. What yeah, was I mean, she like? What was she like to work with? Oh, man. Nancy Wilson was amazing. I mean, <laughs> she's just such a, an amazing vocalist, stylist. Um, when we did the session, you know, I sent her. It was like a great thrill for me for her to sing one of my songs, you know, the, the lyric that I wrote, mm. uh, to have like such a stylist sing a lyric of mine was just the uh, best feeling in the world. Mm. And um, so it was not an easy melody at all. And we did three takes. And by the time we got done with the third take, it was like really close. I was like, oh, this is going to be great. You know, so it was just one more take and we got it. And then I looked up, and she had her purse over her shoulder, and she was <laughs> out of the studio. And yep. she said, oh, that was it. Okay. And I was like, oh, boy. <laughs> okay. So, you know, I had to do, you know, some comping and stuff, you know, between takes just to, you know. I'm the person that will always go for one more, but, you know, I'm also the person that can make something happen when all of it's not there, you know, in a take. So. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, can you go more into detail about that, you know, because there are certain personas in recordings, you know, people who say, that's it, I've done everything, I've said everything, why would you do another one? Right. Okay. But I'm curious, why uh, I use somebody that goes for yet another one? Well, I am... Sometimes, but not all the time, but a lot of times. I mean, a little bit of a perfectionist, but also, you know, I have a vision and it's always a 
producer always has to figure out that sweet spot between your own vision and the artist. Mm. And, um, you know, sometimes I push the artist a little, maybe, you know, maybe a hair too much, but most people, you know, I think enjoy working with me. And I think, uh, the pro the product, the end product, you know, comes out good. So I think that, <laughs> You know, my, my, you know, I, I make sure it's not painful <laughs> you know, for somebody, you know, yep. but, um, what would be a way that you would push somebody? Well, with vocalists, hearing certain things, sticking to melodies, um, telling them, it really depends on what's happening. Sure. Um, if they're improvising, you know, so, just having to do it again or uh, it depends you know this genre doesn't have a lot of tuning people don't like to they really want to capture whatever they sang uh, I think if something's a great performance I don't mind tuning a note a little bit if that helps because the performance itself you know the emotion of the performance was there uh, but some people don't want that, so then I might really go in, you know, on uh, intonation and things like that. But um, you know, it really depends. I, I remember doing a session with uh, George Duke for Diane Reeves' record "Bridges," I think it is, and we played uh, Billy Child's arrangement of "In Your Eyes." And I, I think we did three takes, and I, I said, oh, "I need one more. You know, we got to do one more." And he's like, oh, okay. You know, then we went in the studio. He went back in the control room. Then he said, you know, Terry Lynn, you're tripping. Uh, we're, we're, we're not making a, uh, we're not carrying cancer here. We're just making a record. <laughs> and he didn't let us do another one. You know, and I learned from that experience that one more is not always, you know, the best way to do it. Sometimes you have to go with what it is. And also, Marcus Miller also talks about knowing when you've peaked. At mm -hmm. a take and when it starts to go downhill, mm -hmm. knowing when it's time to just bail. Uh, but what's interesting about that idea is I remember doing uh, a session with Wayne and Herbie and Ira Coleman for Gershwin's World when we played um, Cottontail. And I think we played, like, honestly, like 13 or 14 takes. Wow. It was a lot. I was, always, I was always wondering about that that take. So I'm, I'm glad you're talking about it. But we spent a whole day on one song. and But the thing is, by the time we got to like, you know, 10, 11, 12, that, that area, it was really turning into something else. And it was really getting like amazing. <laughs> They ended up using the, an earlier take because... Uh, the takes that were the most musical were too long. And of course you could just edit, but then it's difficult to edit because what they started doing was, um, well, no, they started stretching because also the earlier take, I think the one that was used, I have to go back and listen. Either that one was where they didn't do that type of solo over the form thing. Maybe they interacted um, and they like that idea better than the solo over the form. But the longer takes, they were stretching over, you know, so Wayne took a solo and Herbie took a solo, you know, I probably took a solo, I don't know, you know, it, so there was a lot more stretching. Mm. And um, de definitely difficult to edit. So uh, they went with the earlier take. And so we spent all that time really, I would really just love to hear those outtakes. I don't know, um, you know, how that's possible or who has them. But uh, when we're all old, those outtakes will probably come out. People that have gone and, you know, moved on to another dimension. Mm. But who kept who kept on pushing for another take on, on that song? Oh, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure I'm always ready to do more takes. That's just my nature. But um, I couldn't, you know... Apparently, Herbie and Wayne wanted to too, or they well, we wouldn't have. Mm. And that's when you know money wasn't as much of a uh, 
problem. Like, you know, he could spend a whole day in a studio on one song. <laughs> It's incredible. I've recently talked to Chris Davis. Mm -hmm. And we had a nice conversation. Uh, and we talked about you as well. And I really, really like uh, the new record of hers that, that you're on. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I, I'd be curious to get your perspective on that record because I, for me it was very um, nice and uh, I was very uh, surprised to see you in that company of, of th this particular group. Uh, I mean, it wasn't a group before, but a group of people. And with some of them, I've, I've seen you before, obviously with Esperanza, but I hadn't seen you with Tony Malaby and, you know, that kind of scene. Uh, so, and also, and the curiosity and, and excitement went on when I then listen, listened to the record, you know, and listened to it a couple of times. And I really like what you guys created there. Oh, thank can, you. Can you describe the, the, the process and the, that session a little bit? I think it started really the idea. We, we played a gig at um, the Stone. Oh, I think it was Duo. And um, then I, I did a, another gig where I had, had Val come play too. This started that idea of using, the, uh, Chris having the idea of using the three of us as a nucleus for a project. And then she started uh, working on some things, some prepared piano pieces and where, you know, using um, the technology with Val to sample and, uh, and then writing, you know, different music. I think then, you know, a, not a stretch for her, but uh, it's funny because when we started recur recording, the producer was calling it, I think, a funk record or the engineer. It, you know, it's kind of like a funk record. I was like, oh, okay. So it was definitely with the idea of putting more groove uh, behind, you know, I, I guess... I, as you said, I'm not necessarily known in those circles uh, so much, but you know, I've had. I, I reached out to Chris originally from hearing her play, and then we developed a relationship. And I wanted to play with her, and I wanted to, uh, you know, I think she made a lot of, uh, you know, more experimental music make sense, you know, to me even more. Not that I other people didn't, but there was something with her time that I really could hear myself, you know, in, even when she's playing free where, you know, or what's considered free, her time has a certain punctuation to it that uh, really spoke to me. And that's why I reached, yeah, I reached out to her. So I think it was you know, a pretty, you know, natural connection once we played Uh, improv improvised set like an hour uh, improvised set at the stone and um, she started writing music uh, maybe some things she had already been working on uh, because I had her do a clinic at Berkeley and um, I uh, it was myself and a, a bass player that was a grad student there and Tia Fuller and we played a few of Chris's songs and one of them Uh, ended up being uh, Stone's Throw, I think it's called, mm -hmm. on, the, on the record. It was called the Stone Tune at first. Uh, uh, and that's, that was a, the most difficult of the songs. And um, at least I had the opportunity to have played it once before. But um, it's like, you know, the one that you don't want to just sight read <laughs> at the session. It's a song where it sounds like if you just hear it, It sounds like somebody just kind of playing maybe out of time and, you know, but it's very much written and um, it's very much worked out. It's really a masterpiece, I think. Mm. Yeah, and a really great uh, tool for learning, you know, for students, I think, to work on their reading. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, yeah, we got to the studio. I mean, she, we rehearsed once before just as a trio with her and myself and Val and maybe try to, you know, find some grooves and some things that could work. And uh, then we got to the studio and that's where it all happens, you know. 
I mean, with those musicians, uh, I just don't think, you know, she could really go wrong. Mm. Uh, you know, such, and I was, you know, very uh, excited to uh, play with Mark Rebo, uh, especially I was a big fan of his, uh, you know, over the years. So, yeah. Cool. Um, you've just um, mentioned time, uh, mm -hmm. the topic of time, and I'm wondering how you worked uh, on on your time and your your sense of time over the years. Uh, uh, for me, it's more innate. I never really worked on it. I mean, it's just you develop an internal clock, and I think that's I I've always just trusted that. And how about um, what I'm amazed also about is your the fluidity that comes through your uh, rhythms. It doesn't really seem like this. It seems more like this, you know. But I suppose there is there's a lot of effort behind that to to arrive at that point. How where you can get from one thing and, or mix it with another thing, and it seems like like this in terms of <laughs> instead of this you know I don't know if that makes any sense to you but no it does I think uh, how, it's really how you hear the instrument how you hear music and what you're trying to portray and what you like when you hear other people and for me that's the thing that I gravitate to uh, how you know fluidity and uh, sound being like water you know not totally solid <laughs> mm -hmm. And being you know malleable and able to create shapes, uh, so I think that's always what I've been attracted to with uh, music. But on the other hand, I'm also attracted to just straight tribal rhythms, you know, just grooves that just lock and you know repeat. Sure. But I mean, they they can they can generate a fluid fluid feeling as well. You know, when you listen to it, you're not listening it to Like you know, like this, it creates a wave kind of thing as well. I I feel. Yeah, yeah. It's all in how you approach it, um, how you balance, you know, your sound, how you, you know, create uh, textures, you know, with your sound. Uh, like when I say balance, like if I play a snare drum inside of a groove too hard or too loud, that's going to make it feel more restrictive. Right. You know what I mean? So it's an important sound and how you balance your cymbals and your kit to also help with that uh, f fluidity. Uh, and I just, I like, you know, circular phrasing, you know, stuff that feels like it doesn't have a beginning and an end, mm. uh, opposed to uh, stuff with pointy edges. <laughs> That's something that I... Uh connect with the groove on angular you know right when you said this that groove came back to my, mm -hmm. to my mind you know as i told you on the phone yesterday i, I was learning uh, the middle way all right <laughs> so i was wondering how how that was for you to to then have herbie uh, uh you know as a as a sideman on your record yeah and how uh yeah Did you write this with, with him in mind, or is, is, was that a song that you had um, uh, that that you had in your book uh, already for a long time? And uh, what was the process of that song? I really like liked that song. Um, yeah, thank you. It was just something I wrote, you know, all through the years. You know, I didn't record a, another record after my first. Um, debut album on Polygram called Real Life Story. I didn't record another record for a long, very long time, but I was writing, you know, throughout that time and, um, you know, tr making demos for Blue Note. Uh, I made a couple of demos for them uh, and other labels that in, in, in the end never signed me. Hmm. So um, Middle Way was a song that I had written and then when I finally... Uh, decided to just go in the studio and pay for it myself and make a record. Uh, that's when I played Middle Way. So what I did for that session, 
uh, I, I had like, um, what was it called? Spec time. It's the studio where you pay them later if you if something comes with the record. I used frequent flyer miles to get Gary Thomas and Paul Ballen back out there. Um, Herbie, I just went on, I was on the road with him and I just, you know, toured without a salary, you know, to, to be like a barter for payment. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just did whatever it took to, uh, you know, make a record. Mm. And um, then I ended up, uh, it ended up coming out on act musically, yeah. but that record was done, you know, completed before then. Mm. Um, so no, I didn't write it with Herbie in mind, but I felt like he would be, you know, perfect person to play it. Yep. And we, then we ended up playing that live with, yeah. Uh, yeah we as musicians sometimes have these periods of self doubt where we, you know, second guess what we're doing or where we're very uh, conscious about what we don't like about our playing or something. Mm -hmm. and, um, I was wondering if, if you remember when you had these situations or if you had them, how you dealt with, with them, you know, self criticism, stuff like that. Uh, man, I mean, that's just, a, I think a part of it, you know, we all, deal with that we all need to be uh, self-critical because that's how we get better and move forward um anybody that's walking around just thinking oh yeah i'm the shit <laughs> <laughs> you know it's probably not our favorite artist <laughs> mm -hmm. i don't know anybody that doesn't have a level of self-criticism kind of always there i mean it doesn't have to go as far as you know, Sonny Rollins, you know, stopped playing for a few years or mm -hmm. um, ever. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I can see it maturing over the years. Mm -hmm. Like, when I started, I was more critical. Uh, I'm still highly critical, but I don't let it affect me in the same way that it did back then. And, um, you know, Wayne was actually very instrumental in that. You know, he said, you know, music is just a drop in the ocean of life. You've used it on your record, right? Yeah, yeah. I was very happy to hear that quote. <laughs> it's beautiful. Yes, that's why. <laughs> What's funny is I have Billy D. Williams saying some of that. Yeah, he is. That was his voice. Okay. Yeah. Wow. And he's married to Wayne's ex-wife. So that's like really, okay. it was kind of interesting. And when I played it for Wayne, that song, he said, that sounds like stuff I say. I said, right. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you know, you move into these places where you don't judge. You know, Herbie talks about that too, you know, not judging yourself and you get to a place of fearlessness you know where you can um accept you know whatever happens without judging and um sometimes it might be really good and other times it just might not be <laughs> mm -hmm. but uh you know it's i think you know the listener and people connect often with something bigger than whatever it is you're criticizing. You know, I think that nobody else is really criticizing in the same way. And, uh, you know, I think people are really rooting for you. You know, people are looking for a good experience. You know what I mean? As opposed to sitting in the audience and judging you and comparing you to other people, you mean? Yeah. I mean, musicians might do that because it's more, <laughs> you know, our nature, but we don't make a career plan for musicians anyway. So I think you just do your best and see where the chips fall. Mm. <laughs> do you have kind of a practice routine or something? that I do not. You never have? <laughs> I never have. I just yeah. warm up. <laughs> just warm up and then yeah. play along with records or do you play along with records also? Well, not these days, but that's how I started. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's a good tool, you know, to be able to do uh, in your formative years, especially. What were some of your go-to memories to play along, um, uh, records to to play along with? Oh, that's hard because I was so young. You know, my dad played a lot of records. Uh, Car Silver, The Kicker, mm -hmm. um, a lot of blues, organ stuff, uh, to get that feeling, you know, of grooves and swing and blues. Um, let's see. Of course, of Miles Davis, <laughs> John Coltrane, just, yeah, just whatever. I mean, there's tons of stuff. I just had fun playing along with, you know, records. I can't, sure. you know, really, you know, I can't transport myself quite that far back in time, but, you know, because, like, when I was in college, I was listening uh, more, you know, sometimes would listen with people, uh, and so I, I, I have some memories of, you know, listening to a lot of that Herbie stuff, the live in Japan one with the uh, actual proof and all that on it, a uh, butterfly. Flood. Flood, yes. Listening to Flood, that really mm. was one I love. Killer record. Mm -hmm. And uh, Charles Lloyd with Boris Flower with Jack and Keith. Mm. Um, uh, live at Monterey or wherever it was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Of course, like again, lots of miles. <laughs> Did you ever meet Miles when when you were playing with? Uh, with oh, yeah. Sure, we uh, opened. Uh, I don't say open, but we played the same bill mm -hmm. with two summers in a row in Japan. Mm. How was that? Did you get to hang out with him a little bit? I mean, as much. I mean, he didn't really hang, um, but we were all on the same flights. And I mean, he sometimes sat right in front of me. <laughs> and, um, yeah, just, you know, he wasn't really hanging. Um, but yeah, we, you know, he, I remember him wishing me a happy birthday <laughs> on my birthday. Because I didn't really go up to him and try to talk to him. Because mm -hmm. I just felt like everybody was, you know, doing that. And, I was like, he must not enjoy this. <laughs> so I just it kind of ignored him, really. Uh, and then finally, like, I remember one day we we're sitting in an airport, and I don't know why I was sitting by myself for a moment. I had headphones on. And then uh, he was walking to the bathroom, and then he said, Happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> that was really sweet. Yeah. 